Hmm. I think we sometimes look at the instrument like this complicated magic box or something like there's something happening in there that we don't understand but really it's all happening within our own bodies and mm -hmm. like I think it really unlocked a lot of those secrets for me that things that I would just struggle with over and over but didn't know why and didn't know how mm -hmm. to fix them so um I think he once said he's like the, the expert prognosticator or something like you play something he knows exactly why it's not working and he knows exactly how to fix it <laughs> so oh, that's that's and, awesome. And wow. it was great. It, it would, that was a fast track to getting better. So that was really nice. Um, so and, after Rice, um, yeah. did you find that uh, that kind of like that training mentality, like that group training mentality kind of carried over to starting Genghis Barbie and then kind of, you know, to uh, maybe, I mean, it's one of those attitudes that you can take anywhere. So I wasn't at Rice. I didn't study there, but I took some of the fundamentals and you know, whoever I had around me at the time. I was living in Port Townsend, Washington, and I took the board from the land trust, you know, and I just said, hey, could I play a mock audition for you? Yeah. <laughs> and so they served pie, drank coffee, and I played mock auditions for people it's that so like, weren't musicians, but it still got me nervous yeah. and it got me like, and they just picked random extra. They picked the hardest ones because that's, <laughs> you know, like, oh, let's do Bach. Oh, let's do like, you know, Beethoven. <laughs> Brandenburg straight into Shasti five. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> sounds like a sounds like a captain's list for those yeah. who've done that. Um, yeah, I think that's one of the best pieces of advice that I got from being at Rice was the audition experience. We would do a lot of mock auditions, and it really changed sort of my preparation for auditions to really start focusing on um, getting comfortable with the actual audition part of it. So mm. you learn how to play the horn by doing your fundamentals every day. And then you yeah. have to also learn how to play an audition and you have to learn how to execute those excerpts every time, not just the one time when you happen to do a really good job, but every single time you're playing, mm. you know, as much as is humanly possible. So mm. um, that really shifted my preparation. Um, and I have to say, I wasn't like that natural at auditioning because I, I like to approach things just like from within and very like just spontaneously. And it wasn't that natural for me to, to get into that practice of being oh, consistent. Yeah. And so um, I think it was actually, I took a break from auditioning after Rice for, and that's when Genghis Barbie happened. I was freelancing, traveling. And after some years of that, like six or so years, I really felt like, okay, I want to get an orchestra job. Like I had taken some auditions, but I was like, I really want to like focus on this and figure it out because I wasn't getting jobs I was auditioning for. And it really took a mindset shift for me where in, I had this whole kind of stigma about auditions where it's like, oh, they're not for me because I am like, musical and I don't play perfectly and so I can't win a job and it's not fair and I had this mentality around that and at, at a certain point I was like well this isn't getting me anywhere <laughs> this sort of mindset of just being angry at the system you know is not helping me to get to where I want to be professionally so I was like you know what if I'm that good if I'm good enough then I can figure out how to do this and I can f just build a, a new skill. It doesn't mean I have to deaden myself inside or something, yes, yes. but I can build a new skill on top of that. So I moved back to Seattle actually at that point from New York wow. and really focused in on practicing and focusing on a different sort of approach to playing for auditions. And wow. I took a lot of auditions that year. Um, some of them were absolutely terrible, crash and burn. <laughs> so uh, my audition for- there for St. Louis was like absolutely hilarious. It was so bad. <laughs> it's still I'm so embarrassing to me. Like I'll, I'll never forgive Roger for putting that low attitude on that audition because it was so hard. Anyway, <laughs> um, <laughs> it was so bad. So, but that was a big turning point for me that that whole year of really kind of just realizing, you know, I can shift my mental approach. I can shift my practice and I can figure this out. It's not insurmountable. It's yes. not just an unfair thing. It's, it is, in this case, something that I'm able to shift my perception to achieve. Wow, and that's powerful. It, I don't, I mean, not like that's a magical solution and it will work, but that's what yeah. it what was, it, for me, uh, made it possible for me to get my first job in San Diego. 
well, attitude and, you know, then all of a sudden, like, all right, I'm curious about this problem. Let me see, like, how can I approach this in a different way? What uh, am I doing that's not allowing me to pass to that next level? Yeah. Those are some of the things I really enjoyed about auditioning. Um, and mm -hmm. then I also enjoyed seeing my friends in different cities. I know. It's so fun. There's people I know, like, just from auditions. <laughs> yeah, me, me too. Like people I just have only met at auditions, which is so funny. Yeah, it's a really funny little... I mean, the whole system is weird, and I still think it's weird, and I still think it's incredibly flawed, but... Well, it's the uh, best thing we got, right? It's I what mean, we got. So if, if and, it's what you want to be in an orchestra, then you have yeah. to sort of accept that and figure it out. It reminds me, actually, of... Um, <laughs> I have these four words. I call, I call them the four words of 2012, because that was when I sort of... They came to me as, like, a mantra, but they were... Can they you say them on the air? Me, what? Can you say them on the air? Are they four oh, yeah, letter four words? <laughs> okay. They're not four letter words. They're just four okay, words. All right, okay, oh, okay um, <laughs> all right. Just four words. Sorry, got it. So the, the first word is empathy, which I think is like the most important thing in the whole wide world. Um, and I would love to see more of. And I think we need to explore more how we teach empathy and how we spread empathy um, just as human beings. But also as musicians, I think empathy is important because it helps you to remember that you're one of many and that it helps you to respect other people's ideas, other people's styles, sounds, you know, choices. Um, the second word is vulnerability, which I think is the other most important thing in the whole wide world <laughs> that I wish we could, you know, explore more as human beings. Um, and as musicians, vulnerability is really, like, crucial, especially for horn players. Like, there's possibly nothing more important, I think, than being comfortable with being vulnerable because you ha it takes so much strength to be vulnerable, <laughs> but like you won't show your full self unless you are willing to risk whatever negative, you know, thing might come your way, which is usually like made up in your mind anyway. Um, and that's, I think one of our biggest struggles is how can we be vulnerable so that we can really be our full selves. And I think part of that, we need to really, analyze our culture especially in orchestras about how we judge ourselves and how we judge each other because i think we're not necessarily achieving our full potential as humans when we're playing music um so i have some thoughts about that um the third and so the third and fourth words go together and they're honesty and acceptance and to wow. me i think that's what reminded me of these words is that um, when you're a musician, you need to be honest about, and that's what I spent my four years at Juilliard not doing was totally just being in denial about what I could and couldn't do on the horn. And I didn't, I just was trying to hide all my flaws from my teacher. I was like, mm -hmm. why did I waste all that wonderful time with my teacher and all my amazing colleagues there just trying to pretend I had nothing to learn? Like that was a big loss of um, opportunity. So I always try to recommend to students that I work with now, like this is your time to just, you know, be really open about your struggles. And when someone plays for me in a masterclass and sounds good, I'm like, I don't want to hear this. Like, what aren't you good at? <laughs> like, let me help you. Yeah. yeah um, wow. And so being honest about where you are and then also accepting it because it's okay. Like we're all on a different place in our journey and there's no right or wrong place to be. So mm -hmm. that's another like gripe I have with music education is like there are these levels that you you're sort of expected like oh I should be able to play Strauss 2 by now or look at so-and-so can do this and I can't what's yeah. wrong with me and it's really like I wish it was just a more of a spectrum thing like all things can we just get rid of this either or vibe um, yeah. yeah because it really should be this experience for every person to to enjoy and explore and just like experiment and and fall in love with the horn in their own way wow. and so I, that's what i hope for the future <laughs> that we can have a little more of that um but honesty and acceptance and that also goes along with just on the human side not the musician side um that we are honest about who we are as people and that we also accept that and that we also accept who other people are so that we can be our full selves. And, and if we all were doing that, like it would be a very different world. <laughs> Let's just put yeah. it that way. 
you know, it's like in you demonstrate acceptance when you accepted the audition si um, system. You also <laughs> yeah. demonstrate acceptance when you said, hey, listen, this is the economic climate right now. Like, mm -hmm. there's just great right. jobs. <laughs> and it's like, it always reminds me of the serenity prayer, right? Um, mm -hmm. Grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage yeah. to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Right. And it's right. like, you just kind of sum that all up with your approach to the horn. There's Let's also see. a great quote, and I'm sure I'm going to butcher it. And I'm pretty sure it's Audrey Lord, And she said, grant me the wisdom to, or... God, I'm totally going to butcher this. Someone should Google it. Change the things that I cannot accept is basically the gist of it, which I also really love. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. A little bit of uh, that in there. So I guess this would be like a really good place for us to transition to um, your service initiatives. I would love to just hear about um, your approach to your humanitarian work and what like uh, joys that's brought you in your life and what joys that's brought you. Um, I, I feel for me, one of the greatest gifts I can have in my life is by helping another person or helping yeah. Other people. Yeah. I agree. <laughs> yeah. I think it's been a bit of a journey for me, especially the older I get to sort of like appreciate what I can do as a musician, because sometimes it feels a little frustrating with everything, all the injustice that exists in the world and that my skill is playing the French horn. <laughs> it's like, I'm always questioning, like, is this enough? Like, is this worthwhile? Um, and so I have a lot of questions, which I think is healthy to ask these questions of ourselves constantly. Um, but I really have come to, it's actually, I feel like in this period of coronavirus, seeing how people have reacted to the things that have been by the musicians and Seattle, Seattle symphony horns and the videos I've put out. I just really like feel that connection from people. And when I perform, you know, it that connection is so real and so valuable. So I, I really do appreciate that. And I really feel so lucky that that's something I've been blessed, like, and fortunate and privileged in my life to cultivate because I feel like I've had all these opportunities to, to pursue this thing, you know, like I'm sure there's a million other people out there who could play horn better than me, who just like never had the horn in the first place or didn't have the support from whoever, you know? And so I, I think about that a lot. Like, yeah, that, the that gratitude of like, Hey, we get to do this on a regular basis. Yeah. So yeah. how do we show that gratitude? Exactly. Like, and like, for me, it's I, like, okay, of what that gratitude looks like i'm gonna wake up and practice because i've been given this right. gift exactly. okay like i you know man like i maybe i don't want to play like i don't know the the music to jurassic park tonight at a pops you know or what's wrong concert. with you <laughs> that's the best music <laughs> i'm just i'm just i'm trying to pull out an example of course i love <laughs> playing jurassic park but you know i'm just saying like you know sometimes like we don't feel like playing the concert that night and, yeah. you know, because we have so many concerts and we're, you know, maybe whatever's going on in our lives. And yeah. it's like, no, 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 this is an opportunity for me to share. And this is an opportunity that would connect me with other people. And yeah. and so many people want to see Jurassic Park with like a live symphony <laughs> orchestra. It's like, Including that, me. that I went to is LA the to important see it. concert. It might not be right of spring. It might be, yeah. that's the one yeah. that like links these kids in to be like, man, this is the instrument that I want to play. And this is going to change exactly. my life. Exactly. Exactly. I think for a lot of people, that's going to be at least the doorway, you know. Um, that's Don't so be funny dissing because... no John Williams and stuff. <laughs> Seriously. I, <laughs> nice comment. I played, we played Jurassic Park in May, like last May. And then I went to LA to see it, to see LA play it because I love it so much. So that was a bad example for me. Um, but, <laughs> but this reminds me of, um, this reminds me of what I, I was mentioning this when you were interviewing Dale the other day, Dale Clevenger, that one of my favorite things and one of my favorite stories that like really I think about a lot is something I heard him say. He used to teach at, or he still teaches at Marrowstone Music Festival, which is a festival out here. And that's the yeah, festival I grew up going to. You yeah, know about Port Townsend. Well, yeah. now it's no longer in Port Townsend, but. Oh, it's on Marrowstone Island, Island, right? Uh, now it's in Bellingham. Oh, so Bellingham. it used to okay. be in, in Port Townsend, but now it's in Bellingham. Um, but we were there and 
like at lunchtime, Dale and his wife, Alice, would always sit with all the horn students. It was so cool and so nice. I was like 13 and just get to have lunch with them. And one of the students asked him, they were like, Dale, how many times have you played Mahler 5? And he was like, hundreds, like at least a hundred, if not hundreds of times, you know. And someone was like, don't you get bored? Like, don't you ever get bored playing Mahler 5? And he was like, you know, this may, might be my hundredth time playing Mahler 5, but there's somebody in the audience who's hearing it for the very first time. I'm always going to play it for that person. And I wow. was like, oh, my God. <laughs> wow. And I, but I think about that a lot because even, even playing the same concert three or four times in a week, sometimes you're like, here I am at work, you know, and I have to remember, like, there's people here who – this might be their first time at the symphony. This might be their first time seeing a French horn being played. This might be like a big splurge that they like saved up to come see this concert. And like, I'm not gonna disrespect mm. that by, you know, by just like forgetting that, you know? So I try to keep that in my mind when I'm playing concerts, but I think it is a bit of a struggle when you, when your job is your passion, it's, it's complicated. <laughs> that's really complicated. Exactly. Yeah, that's, so, that's... absolutely. Do we want to um, try to take some questions from people? Sure, if anyone I love has questions. any questions. Um, I see there are a lot of people on here that, you know, have written in. I'm going to see if there's anyone that's actually, you know, said any uh, questions. Could you tell us about recording your albums with uh, Genghis Barbie? Oh, so yeah. <laughs> you recorded five albums with Genghis Barbie, and yeah. you also did a Christmas album where you sang Mariah Carey's yeah. All I Want for Christmas. <laughs> I mean, it's like one of my favorite horn albums, <laughs> one of my favorite pieces. And like, your singing is, is the definition of vulnerability. I mean, it's just like, <laughs> it's so personal. And, you know, Thank like, you. yeah, I, first of all, I just, I, how do you uh, tell us about that? I mean, and then how do you transfer the singing into the horn? So that's such a good question because like playing the horn, I've been playing the horn and singing for about the same time I started singing in fifth grade choir because my friends were in choir and I was like that looks like fun I want to hang out with them like, I didn't even know I was a good singer I just like started and then I like had a solo I was like oh I guess I'm good like I didn't know um so then I got really into singing and I did a lot of jazz singing and I they've really become linked for me like when I play horn I'm really feeling like I'm singing. And I think that's important, of course, wind and song, you know, song and wind is a, a classic um, philosophy. But it really, I've learned so much from, from being a singer about horn playing. And especially when I'm playing with Genghis Barbie, like when I'm playing, I'm always singing the words in my head as I'm playing. I'm never like playing the horn. I'm always singing mentally and spiritually singing. So I think that, and that has helped me to bring that into the classical realm. Like when I'm playing classical music, I hope to also be singing rather than the, it's sort of like the Clevenger art and craft. Um, I want to really make sure that I'm always, that I have the craft like worked up so it's there for me, but that I'm really mm. not focusing on that. I, I can't focus on that um, when I'm playing a solo or something, which literally happens once a year because I play fourth horn. Um, <laughs> so, um, but they've definitely helped me with each other. Singing has really helped my horn playing and horn playing has really helped my singing. I did have to sort of make a choice in high school, which one to, to pursue. And that was kind of sad because I was doing so much that I couldn't do both anymore. And so I decided that I would pursue the horn because I thought that a classical music career was like more stable, <laughs> which I think is hilarious, um, but probably true. So that's so, awesome. Uh, yeah. Do you have any stories about being on the road or like, you know, um, you know, touring or concerts with Genghis Barbie? I mean, it's like three or do four I? of your, <laughs> your, your best, your best friends. I mean, you know, oh my God. So you'll, we... share, you'll share with us. We just had like a, we just had a mini tour in, in the Northwest, in Seattle and Portland. And we were just laughing so hard, recounting all these gig stories. <laughs> like we could, we should write a book, honestly. It would be so funny. We've had too many stories to even really like pick one. Um, but I think like, well, you were asking about, or someone had asked about recording. 
And that has been really interesting because just finding time to record, like I can't believe we made the last album we made, which is called Too Legit. It's available Too everywhere. Legit. Too Legit. It's all classical music because that's, because we used to get asked all the time, do you also play legit music? And we were like, oh God, like our music is so legit, but you know, so we were like, let's make an album of classical music and we'll call it Too Legit. So we did. Um, but I, I live here in Seattle and they live in New York. So somehow we were able to um, make this album. So I don't know how we did it, honestly. But even when we lived in New York, we were so busy. And just to record an album, like, it's expensive. It takes time. It was it was a lot of work. And some of those albums, like, one of them we recorded, like, literally during a New York Phil audition when when three of the four of us were in the semis, like, the next day. And we were, like, trying to record. And it was very awkward. <laughs> Wow. Uh, that was when Leelani got that job. So um, it was hilarious. Yeah. So we, so we uh, it's always been an adventure. But what's been beautiful about that group is that we've always just done what whatever we wanted. Like, that's the beauty of having your own group is like, I don't have to wait for someone to give me an opportunity. Like, we have an idea. We're inspired. We're like, let's do it. You know, like, let's just make this happen. <laughs> and we did somehow. Wow, you just kept doing like one, the next step, the next little yep. step, the next little yes. step. Yeah. Wow. Reinventing ourselves. We've, we've reinvented many times. We've had new members. Um, we've sort of shifted our focus many times because you know, our lives have changed so much since 10 years ago. <laughs> um, we have a question here. Could you talk about how you weren't good at low horn playing, <laughs> but ended up playing a low horn job? Where was the turning point and maybe how you improved your low register? And that's from um ace lingo 24 i have a lot of questions myself um well the real answer is um i studied with bill right here and i also was there at rice with those five like totally killer low horn women like it was so amazing to hear what they could do like i was just blown away constantly um but really what it was was like a lot of the time people will tell me they struggle with their low range and I'm like, well, you know, how much are you practicing your low range? <laughs> They're like, yeah, of course you're bad at it. You never worked on it. Like it's not, it's not just something that comes naturally. So that always makes me laugh, but that's who I was. You know, I wasn't good at it because I was afraid of it and I didn't know how to, I didn't know how to play low. And so I didn't do it because I didn't like to do something I was bad at. And so what I learned from Bill was sort of like how to play the horn. So this concept of the path and um, vowel shapes. Um, Eli Epstein has this amazing YouTube video. If you haven't seen it, I think it's called finger breathing and vowel shapes or something like that. Mm. It's awesome. He really talks about the, the shape, the inner shape, the vowel sound that corresponds with pitch for us. Mm. That's just like, that's pretty much it. Most people who struggle with low playing have too much tension in their embouchure. That's like number one. So you really have mm. to revisit your setup because that's what you're giving yourself to work with if it's too tight you won't be able to get the openness to play low um usually the tongue position is too high oh my god colio hi um, colio. usually the tongue position is too high and so you're not getting the the appropriate vowel shape um and usually you're not using enough air so the low range air is like a different physical sensation than the high range air and it's less um, intuitive. And I think that's why so many people struggle with it because you really have to generate a huge force of hot air. Mm. So like holding a low note, especially loud or even actually soft is like a, a different concept. That's a little less intuitive and a little less natural to come by. So you have to practice it and learn it. So it's mm. like, I always imagine like, remember those disaster movies in the nineties, like deep impact, <laughs> And there's this tidal wave that's like not possible physically, but it's like 600 foot tidal wave and it's coming. Like, that's how I think, that's what I think about when I'm playing like Mahler one, low, low X. That's awesome. It's like this massive force, but it's just like moving very slowly. <laughs> but it has to be open. It has to be big. Um, and it just has to be, you have to have the right set. Just put the horn on their face. And then they go forward and they're not thinking about that step, but the, the step at which you, push the mouthpiece onto your lip is like essential. It's an essential moment that all else must come after that. So that's a big Clevengerism. Yes. You always press on relaxed lips. I cannot sing it yeah. from the mountaintops enough. It's that you need, you need your lips to be able to vibrate um, 
as easily as possible so that the most air that you're capable of putting through is able to move through the horn. Because if you, if it's too tight or if the lip is too tight or stretched or anything too pursed, you can't put enough air in to play the horn properly. So you have to make sure that the air is able to get through. Like a lot of people can't push the volume on certain notes past a certain point. That's a red flag and you need to address that and look at why can I not put the air through the horn? What's preventing it? And just start to connect your brain to your body and try to sort of figure those things out. I, I have to say, I disagree with Bill. I don't think the horn is easy, but I do, I do think the horn is very simple and very logical. It makes yeah. so much sense if you can just figure it out and be honest about how it works. It wow. makes so much sense. And that to me has just made it easier. I oh. wouldn't go so far to say it's easy, but. <laughs> <laughs> That's fantastic. That's such great advice. And it's so specific. Like, you clearly know what you're doing when you play. Um, for me, I'm able to like look at it. And then after I look at it, I'm like, all right, now forget it. Don't ever think yeah. about it again. <laughs> it works. That's good. We're good. And yeah, then, yeah. If I need to fix for, it, I can get in there. But then It's I'm funny because for me, I, um, high playing comes more naturally to me. So when I, I got good at low horn by practicing it, I still have to practice it constantly to do my mm -hmm. job. Um, wow. And so I think that that's important for people to know that it's not like you, you figure something out and then you have it. Like some things for certain people, and I think for the horn in general, this is probably true overall, that you have to constantly practice. I have this hilarious memory from college when someone told me that Joe Alessi practiced three hours a day. And I was like, why? He's already in the New York Phil. <laughs> <laughs> and now I'm just like, wow. <laughs> yeah. I definitely practice more now than I ever did, which is so funny because I'm better now than I ever was, but I still practice more just because, it, you know, to maintain the quality I want and to keep progressing, you know, you're always kind of inching up yeah. in your progression. Like you progress this much and then it's like, just to get a little bit better, you know, suddenly becomes a, a lot harder. So um, that's really interesting to me. Like it's a constant um, effort. And especially as a low horn player, I have to remember to practice my high range because you never know when some Shostakovich symphony is coming and you're like, oh, crap, last two weeks were Elgar and Tchaikovsky and I haven't played above the staff in two weeks. Like, so, so you have to really look ahead and plan ahead for what's coming, um, whether you're high or, or low horn player. But I think especially for the low horns, we have to really make sure we remember to play above the staff. <laughs> Oh my gosh! Yeah, I have to remember to play below the staff every day. So. <laughs> you don't. You don't just use the the Clevenger line. That note is below my salary. <laughs> <laughs> I might have used it once or twice. <laughs> That's fantastic, Danielle. Do you have any advice for young players right now that might not have um, access to ensembles or lessons? Like, what would you tell them? How would you tell them to, to stay motivated, stay connected? Yeah, we get that question a lot, like under normal circumstances um, with Genghis Barbie. And I would say like right now, probably more than ever, there's so many resources online right now. So there's a project coming up that's coming out soon from Seattle Symphony Musicians called We Can Do It, Duet. <laughs> and it's going to be like sort of interactive duet videos where you can play along with a symphony musician, which I think is going to be really fun. Um, we're hoping to do some kind of music minus one things with, with the horn section. Um, but there's like unprecedented levels of stuff out there right now on the internet. So just like Google everything, find, um, you know, you can also just play along with recordings, like, except for those old ones on record that are like half a step sharp. That's, that's strange. Don't do that. Um, but, you know, you can play along with your favorite recordings and, you know, play along with Vienna horn sound and play along with Chicago symphony recordings. And um, that's all we that's all we have right now. It's weird. But, you know, that's um, where we're at in this virus situation. Like we have to really get creative about how we do it. So there's these great apps like Acapella and Wondershare. Filmora 9 is one that we've been using in the horn section. Um, where you can kind of like layer these things together and, and actually be able to play music. And I have to say like recording like a French horn video. I made a duet with John Turman, who's third horn. I love him. And I, John. And oh, I John, John, of course. We love John. Yeah. Um, and, and he recorded, we did a Telemann canonic sonata. So he played the one part and I follow a bar later. And the joy that I felt when I started playing along with him, I was like, I didn't even realize like how much I missed it. 
So yeah. I would really recommend that to just like, you know, do that with your friends, like record half of a duet and then just send it to them. Be like, hey, play along, record it, you know, send it back. Just stuff like that. Whatever you can do to sort of keep that connection with playing with other people, because that is so much more special than playing by yourself, practicing by yourself. Just that feeling of playing with another person, even if it's not live, um, is really special. And I hope we can all continue that as much as we can during this whole time. So. In the last three minutes, could you talk a little bit about um, why the arts and why music are so important during this time of coronavirus? <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, I think we're seeing it kind of firsthand. Like we're really seeing how it's helping people cope. Um, this, like I said at the very beginning, like it's unprecedented what's going on. And I've really appreciated the way that people are sharing themselves and musically like couch concerts and you know videos people are putting out just or this like this fireside chat thing like it's so fun for me to watch and and see you interact with people and kind of get to know people in a different way um we just need that connection and i think that this kind of pandemic on a global scale is really for one exposing a lot of our flaws <laughs> a lot of them as society and in order to just deal with that, the, the struggle with seeing that and seeing the reality of what's happening um, for so many people, to me, like it helps me to focus on the music and focus on creating and sharing whatever it is that I have while I am safe and healthy and privileged, like that I can still share that and hopefully someone will feel something, you know? So that's yeah. what I think we all need to strive for. Like I said, share your real self, be yourself, find yourself, find your love. If it's on the horn, awesome. If it's somewhere else, that's cool too. But just share it, be open yeah. and share with as many people as you can connect with. Just to, we, it's not a zero sum thing. We just only build. And I love, I love that about music and art. Wow, thank you so much, Danielle. I really appreciate it. I mean, you're a huge inspiration for me and for a lot of, uh, the horn players out there, but I really appreciate everything you've done and your positivity and your inspiration for today. So Likewise. thank you again for the Fireside thank you. Chat. I look forward to having more conversations with you in the future. Anytime. I'm yeah. here. I've got nothing to do. So. Hugs. <laughs> Thanks for everybody who's here and listening and all my Barbies. Yeah. Shout out to Cully.